Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 264. Now, if you hear a bit of a kind of whir in the background of today's show, I'll be honest, I can't stop it. So as we know, well, at the time of recording of this show, it's currently baking hot in the UK. It's got to be like 30 degrees outside, and my poor little Macintosh Apple fella is screaming being hot recording this podcast and that's why there might be a bit of a whir in the background but we can't complain we can't be british and be like oh it's too hot when we always complain it's too cold so anyway get your vest on get outside flex the guns get a suntan um but a Hopefully you are outside listening to this show because it would be healthy. Go for a walk, get some vitamin D and listen to this show. Anyway, on with today's guest. Now, today's guest I first met at a fitness conference. Uh, I was presenting at the conference. It was Fit Pro uh, last year. Uh, she came and in- introduced herself to me. Uh, and since that point in time, she's been elevating uh, herself and her message, which is a fantastic message, uh, primarily for females, but this stuff will apply for men as well. Um, And hopefully this will appease the fact that apparently I don't get enough females on the show. So for people that do say that, here you go. Here's a lady on the show. Anyway, uh, who is the guest? Uh, Aldine, hello. Hi, how are you doing, Ben? I'm good. Um, Aldine, your full name, Aldine Preisner? Yeah, that's correct. Well done. There we go. Um, (laughs) Aldine, right. Who are you? Currently, what are you doing? What is your focus within the fitness industry? Right, focus for me is um, well, I predominantly train and coach women to be the best version of themselves. Um, I'm a by day I'm a gym manager, so I manage a gym of about three thousand to four thousand members. Uh, We have all walks of life in that gym, so we've got everything from twelve year olds through to kind of seventy two year olds. We've got cancer patients. We've got Um, GP referral, um, teenagers, everything. So we've got a very kind of community feel to where I work. Uh, I also uh, obviously coach female clients, predominantly female. I think I've got one male client. I would say 90% of the people I coach are women. I also manage a team of seven male personal trainers, it is. So kind of. You've got no ladies. Sorry? You've got no ladies in the team. I've been searching for a fantastic female personal trainer for about six months now. So if you know of anyone in the Berkshire area who wants to come work in my gym, um, yeah, send them my way. Well, you've already, you've just put the advert out there, so done. Um, it's just gone to 20,000 people, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of outnumbered in that environment. Uh, um, I also coach a course called Learn to Lift, which is to take women from doing the kind of traditional cardio that we're led to believe helps weight loss and helps kind of slim and tone down, shall we say. And I take them and I teach them to lift weights. So I take them for a five week course where we do half theory, half gym floor based work and I basically coach them to be better. You know, I co- they, a lot of them come in looking for fat loss and they end up coming out of the course and they actually want to be stronger, they want muscles, they want, you know, they want to have the best body they can have. So that's a couple of things I'm doing. Uh, recently, I was in women's health, and I spoke at a fitness conference recently, Be Fit in London, with my my ten steps to maintaining success within health and fitness. So, what we're getting at here is the kind of, and this is going to be the theme of today, in that you are very much looking at a process of empowerment focused on females, because I think males get this. Um, a lot more. There's this kind of drive with a man to uh, inherently be stronger, to yeah. kind of uh, attach fitness to that strength thing. Like I remember when I was 18, I wanted to lift weights to be stronger, to be more alpha, because there is that kind of there's that ego element to us as a sex, as a male. Um, but I wouldn't say that's naturally a female trait. And if it is a female trait, I would say that society potentially does a fairly good job of suppressing that desire through you know advertising belief systems history society like all that kind of stuff definitely i would say the women who come to me who do have that almost male trait of aggressiveness in in the weights area are the ones who have a sporting background so they're the ones who have been taught from a young age to drive to push to focus on achieving um 
something that is is you know some some power achieving personal bests, uh, winning at things. And it's great when I get those sort of women in. Um, it's really inspiring for me to watch. But the majority of women I do get haven't got that drive. So I'm I'm really looking to build that confidence and and push women out of their comfort zone into a better place, so to speak. So let's say we've got two characters. We've got someone that inherently they understand being competitive they're not scared to be competitive to push themselves to be the best person of themselves if you've got someone that doesn't inherently have that how do you tell someone it's okay to want to be better for yourself and be selfish because i think a lot of women are afraid to be selfish um definitely it's it's one of the big problems i face coaching women especially mothers like myself who are used to doing everything for everyone. You know, they're kind of pulled at all angles, they've got a job, they've got a busy home life, they've got children to look after. And in doing that, they almost forget about looking after themselves, self-care, taking time and moments to just just be almost and be still. And that's something that almost gets lost, the art of relaxation. I have a girl on training at the moment, she's got Addison's disease, and um, you know, so she's got complete adrenal failure. And with her, I sat her down, and fair enough, it's all good me personal training her in the gym, but I sat down and I said, you know, when was the last time you took a walk by yourself, or when you had a coffee on your own, or when you just took a bath completely alone, and she could not remember. And it's that kind of thinking that we always have to be on the go. It's almost really, we almost view it as a success. If we're busy, it means we're successful. So I'm trying to get women to move away from that and move into a space where they're comfortable to, you know, go to the gym and have some time alone or go, you know, go and have a coffee or just go for it, just do something that is just for them, which often is, I believe it's perceived as selfish by a lot of us, but it's something I prioritise myself as a busy mum with a full-time job. It's something, it's self-preservation. It is. Um, I think it's easy to get in the habit of not doing that, especially when you get into, and, and this happens at all ages, but when you get into like a new relationship and that relationship becomes a bit more serious and you start to be, spend more time with each other and that re- relationship evolves and there's an assumption there that as that relationship evolves, the time that you have free should now be for that other person. But that, that time still has to be split between the time that you get to be by yourself so if someone works a nine to five and comes home and from six till 10, that time is just spent with that person. If you do that all the time, for me, it's, you're not ever gonna be in a place where you're recharging your own mental state because you're still giving energy to someone else. Despite the fact, love is not in this equation. I'm not saying that that person is not loved and you're showing love towards it someone, but you're still giving away energy. And if you don't take moments for yourself, you never have a chance to really resynthesize that energy to keep giving to other people. Definitely. I had a couple of years ago, I had an illness I couldn't shake. And I went to see the doctor, and I was convinced there must be something wrong, you know, maybe some blood tests or something would reveal something. And it didn't. And this was two years ago. And he just looked at me and said, We live in a sick society in the Western world. There was not enough emphasis placed on yourself, on just being alone. I'm doing things for you and it's that moment where I realized where I was training clients around the clock where I was trying to manage my team where I was trying to well I was answering emails at the breakfast table and I was answering emails when I got home I was speaking to clients at midnight and it was at that point I realized that I needed to step back because it was in fact making me sick doing all this doing all this work so when I talk to my clients I come from a place where I know what it's like to try and take on too much and be superwoman and everything gets compromised as a result I think, I mean, this is an amazingly powerful conversation in that I think it's definitely a modern day problem that, you know, work has evolved to be very busy. And the thing is, in and around this free time, we now have social media, we now have the information age. And if we want at any given time, we can fill dead space, whether it's with two minutes on Instagram or 20 minutes on Netflix. And what I, I've talked about this a lot in my seminars, like I am not saying, and I don't ever say that social media is bad or TV is bad or anything, but there's a, there's a dose dependent response in that we are constantly asking our brain from the moment we get up to the moment we go to bed to work and to process information and to make decisions and absorb things. 
And actually, the brain can't do that. The brain does need a period of time, whether that's five or 30 minutes, where nothing goes in and it's just, it's just able to be. So for you to get that advice from a doctor is pretty cool. Because I bet that advice isn't given that much. No, not all. It was, it was a simple answer funny enough, and it wasn't the answer I was expecting, but it was enough to make me reassess my life, and I was in a position where women, or my clients were looking to me, they were looking to be coached, but I wasn't looking after myself, and I think that in itself made me stop, take a deep breath, look at what I was doing, and reassess what was important. Mm. See, before we get into the, the bulk of this show today, which is kind of your 10 step system, I also want to highlight the fact that when we get more intelligent, we think we're unbeatable. So I see this all the time with personal trainers. Personal trainers know a lot about health and fitness, so they feel that they can be the, um, the unique snowflake with any uh, proven system. And an example is weight training. Like We know that in weight training, it's a good idea to periodize the weight training. So you have periods of uh, effort and then you have periods of rest. But personal trainers, because they know loads, actually, well, I'm just going to keep training all the time because I'm invincible. And I'm like, you're not. If anything, a personal trainer in the modern society is at greater risk of this because they get up early in the morning. If they're quite often late in bed, they don't get enough sleep. They work hard. You couple that with hard training and as a recipe for disaster and I know this because I teach personal trainers and I'll stand in a room of personal trainers and 60% of the room if I stop talking I think would fall asleep within five minutes because they're just chronically tired from their environment. Definitely. I think um, you, we lose a lot of people in the industry within two years because they come into the industry thinking that it's all glamour and it's all you know teaching clients and you know it's, you're going to be in a gym-based environment enjoying your job all the time, but the reality is when you're working four or five hours straight, play, uh, training clients, you know, being on all the time, motivating another individual, um, you know, rarely time to stop and breathe, it can be, can really take it out of you. And we get a lot of people leave because their own training suffers as a consequence. So when I get new trainers that I interview, I always say, is it, are you getting into this because you want to help someone or is it because you like training yourself? And the reality is if you're getting into it because you like training yourself, your own training may actually suffer. And I give this as warning, I'm very open with them. Um, so I think it's important to, to have that balance really, especially where I'm coming from, where I'm a mum and I've got you know, a full-time job and I have to manage my team and my clients. Uh, it's, just, it's just important for me to actually take a moment and just stop from time to time. And without stopping, you don't get perspective. And without perspective, you can't rationally approach a situation and deal with it in the most appropriate way. Um, so yeah, anyway, food for thought with the people that are listening. Um, so you've recently been uh, featured in a few kind of uh, publications and some online work, and you, you're, you're very much trying to promote this message of empowerment. And there's, there's a, a 10 step process that you like to follow. So I'd love to dive into your 10 steps and for you to explain what each one of these means and where the power lies for people in each one of these steps. And you can start with whatever step you like. Okay. Also, because I don't have these steps written down, you do. <laughs> I'll start at the beginning because uh, number one is the first step to the process. But with these steps, it's something I apply to my clients. So um, the the aspect of female coaching that mainly kind of you know guidance with and I you know apply them to my own life I even apply some to my daughter because she's very sporty so these these steps you know there are some uh, will resonate hopefully with some of your listeners if I get one or two that's brilliant if you just take one thing away that's all I want really um, so starting at the beginning step one is to wake up so I get a lot of people come to me and they want, they want to change, they've decided they've had enough, and they come to me and they're looking for help. They usually have some kind of trigger moment along the way. So with, with me, myself, the wake up moment for me was when I was called fat in a nightclub in Clapham. So I was out with a group of friends, I did some verbal abuse about my weight, because I used to be bigger, I was a size 18, and I found myself crying in the corner of the nightclub on the phone to a friend. Um, for me, prior to myself from being a strong woman, this was a pretty low point. 
And it was that which we call the trigger point in the industry, which is the turning point where I, I kind of thought, this has got to change. I deserve more. I was fed up in being in that place, and I wanted more for my body. I wanted uh, better energy levels. I didn't want to be sat in a nightclub being called fat anymore. It was kind of the lowest of the low. I, I, I think, you know, there's a point for a lot of my clients when the pain of being in the situation they're in outweighs the pleasure. So for me, that pleasure was going out on the lash a couple of nights a week. It was um, getting pasties and pre-packaged sandwiches and going out on client dinners. And I was kind of in a place of denial almost. I was trying to help myself. But at the same time, it wasn't a painful enough situation until I had that trigger moment that I decided I was going to take control. And I think that's the key thing here. What I'm looking for when a new client comes to me is someone who's willing to take control. Not looking for me to make all the changes because I can't be there 24-7. I can't be in the kitchen pointing their hand towards the right foods. It's that this person is willing to take control and they're willing to kind of make compromises, I suppose, in the quest for their goal. Uh, there's a great phrase I love, and it says, it's, don't look back, you're not going that way. Mm. And I think in that, it says everything about people who succeed in the health and fitness, you know, this health and fitness business. They decide one day that going backwards is not an option. We're not even going to look, we're not even going to consider the option of going kind of backwards in that way. We're going to go forward, we're going to become better, we're going to achieve more. And I think that is what I'm really looking for in the first instance with a lot of my, lot of my female clients who come to me. Do you think that relates to your why? Because one thing that I like to talk about a lot is that every day your environment is going to push you to take negative actions. So you talked about choosing bad food, drinking alcohol, um, saying yes to, let's say, a cake that was offered to you when rea in the reality you maybe should say no. For me, I link that back to someone's why. Now you've talked about a trigger moment and then you create a powerful why and an association towards actions that you need to take. And that why then underpins your ability to make the decisions that you need to make to get to your end goal. Definitely. It's that shift. It's that, um, it's the ultimate goal setting you know, scenario with personal training. The why, why are you doing this? And does it matter enough to you to stick to it? Uh, because it, it can be very frustrating to get someone come to you and they, they're not ready. They're kind of on the precipice of making change, but they're not uncomfortable enough with their own situation. The why isn't really there, so to speak. As a coach, are you willing to make someone feel uncomfortable? Yes, I am. There is, um, if I'm comfortable enough with the client to do yeah. this, I will use the guilt card. So I will say, if it, you know, if it comes to six months' time and you're not ready for your wedding, you're not in your wedding dress, how will that make you feel? You know, if you get to the beach and you can't wear the bikini that you bought, how's that going to make you feel? If you get down the line and, you, you know, five years' time, you're still where you are, what, what kind of emotions is that going to put you through? So, yeah, it's not, you know, it's not the nicest thing in the world, but, yes, I, I can do that with my clients if need be. I think what people, well, for me, need to realise is that any process of change is not, it's not roses and flowers, like, it's not a beautiful process, like, change, when we've got ourselves into a situation, is quite often uncomfortable, and we have to go through a period of, yeah, crap, like, let's say you're really overweight, and you're starting on a fat loss journey, the first couple of months are going to be quite rubbish because you're going to be living a very different lifestyle. You're going to be taking very different action. You are feeling quite self-conscious about trying to make these changes and be in an environment where potentially people have already got to their end goal. And this is maybe why people find gyms quite intimidating. You walk in as a big person and everyone in there feels and seems fitter than you. And it's, it's not a, a comfortable emotion. So someone's got to be empowered enough to walk into that environment and say, no, I'm here, I deserve to be here, this is the right step, I feel uncomfortable, but this is something I have to do for me. Exactly. I believe it's like having a massive mountain in front of you for some people, but it's whether they've got the strength and the fortitude to make that journey up that mountain. It's your job to kind of coach them along the way. Mm. So, step number two. So step two, this is going to sound a touch cheesy, but you have to love yourself, okay? This <sighs> comes from a kind of touchy-feely place, I suppose, but it's about starting your journey from wanting to be better, 
Okay, and I get a lot of women come to me and the words that come out of their mouths are, I'm horrific, I'm disgusting, I want to get, they have to touch as well, I want to get rid of this, I want to get rid of this. And it all starts from this place where they truly believe what they see in the mirror is hideous. And I believe that will only take you so far in your kind of fitness journey. I think this journey has to start from somewhere, from a place where you want, you have a desire to be better, where you truly deserve, you deserve, you believe you deserve more from life and you want the best you can have. Um, we had a, a kind of personal trainer who was in our gym last year and he started putting up posters for a boot camp, shall we say, a kind of bikini boot camp for women. And on these posters we had the words, banish your baggy bingo wings and slim down your saggy muffin top. <laughs> and I think most of your listeners will agree that kind of thing sits very uncomfortable with me because yeah. he was asking our female members, his new clients, to start their journey from a real place of kind of, kind of hate. Yeah. Uh, when it shouldn't be about that at all. You know, I, I don't believe that you know, that kind of marketing is necessary if you're a good enough trainer. I, um, the, I, I won't echo your thoughts. I think, I think. The, the the struggle for a lot of people is understanding that you can love yourself but want to be better. And I think people think they're one of two things. And the thing is, in life, you never get to an end goal anyway. So people should not feel that wherever they're going right now, there'll be a fish, finish line. We'll cut the ribbon and you'll have inter, eternal happiness. It doesn't work like that. Like when I lost weight, my goal then shifted to wanting to be stronger and more athletic. And then when I got more athletic, I then shifted uh, you know, in a different direction. I was more career focused. Life just continually evolves, but I come from this place of wanting more with an appreciation of myself and loving who I am as a person. Because if you don't have that perspective, the only outcome is negative. Definitely. And I think that, again, that comes back to what we were saying about self-care as well. So that's so key as well. So kind of looking after yourself and taking time for yourself, recovering right and doing all those things are part of the kind of love yourself type approach to fitness. Um, so yeah, the two tied hand in hand, the approach to this journey because you want to be the best you can be and also take some time to look after yourself. That's what I mean by step two about loving yourself essentially. Mm. So it always has to start positively. Please note people. Right, step number three. Step number three is in um is in stark contrast to step number two is to get real. Okay. okay. So this is this is kind of a little bit of a harsh one, but I get a lot of people come to me and they want to look the way they did on the beach in Ibiza when they were eighteen. So a lot of women come my age, I'm thirty five, and they come to me and they're like, oh, I want to be a size six, I want to be a size eight, and yeah, they can probably achieve that, but it's it's going to be really punishing. It's going to be really hard. It's going to be a lot of compromises and you know, for the vast majority, it's not going to be achievable. You know, there's too much perfection in the world, and we're always striving to, to reach a goal, and sometimes those goals can be a touch unrealistic. So I, for one, spent a lot of my 20s chasing this unrealistic goal. I'm more your kind of endo, meso type body, and I was always striving to look like, should we say, the Victoria's Secret model, that kind of live, mm -hmm. uh, lean, you know, statuesque type body. Yep. And it took, I wasted 20 years of my life chasing this goal, thinking that was the paradigm of beauty, that was attracting us, that was going to make me happy. It was only when I got to my 30s, I had, well, two things happened. I realised that life isn't fair, that I'm, I'm not naturally that type. My sisters are very kind of ectomorph, very lean, can eat what they want. Not put on I just came to the realisation, life isn't fair. I've been dealt a different hand genetically, mm. and I just had to work with that. And I'm fine with that because I now know how to deal with it. Uh, the second realization I had was that being having a powerful body, having a strong, curvaceous body is not actually a bad thing. So I spent 10 years of my life trying to fight it. And then I suddenly realized, actually, this isn't so bad. So with step three, get real. What I mean to say is kind of work with what you have. Get real about your goals. Get real about what you can achieve. Um, get real about what you can achieve with your lifestyle as well and understand why you know why you want that as well I think is an important thing I think fitness you're right is very good at painting a perfect picture and I, I try and teach people the life skills that they can stand back and be objective about any given situation or environment because you know as you've rightly said like 
you're a mum, you've got kids, you've got a busy job, there's all this stuff that actually will limit potentially the end result or the speed to the end result as well. And, you know, that's not a bad thing. It's just that is the reality. That is someone's situation. You've just got to work with what you've got. And, you know, this is, I think, this is why I'm glad I chased my health when I was younger because I had a lot of time to devote to it. And, you know, I did spend a lot of time on it. I was in the gym like two hours a day. You know, we can argue that I was a little bit obsessive about it, but I got to an end goal quite quickly and I changed my life quite quickly. But not everyone will have that situation. You can't look at my environment and go, oh, I'm going to do that. Well, the reality is it might take you a bit longer, a bit slower. You might not have as much knowledge as me. And that is okay. Definitely. I think having having those goals but having the realisation it's not going to ha- happen tomorrow is is so helpful because it stops people getting derailed by fitness. I often have to take out my before and after when I get a new client and they say, how long is this going to take? And I tell them, for me, it took 14 months after my second job. And I show them the transition because I want to be realistic. I don't want to say to them, you're going to wake up in three weeks' time and you're going to drop three dress sizes and look like a fitness model. We have to be realistic with them um, and set realistic expectations of what can be achieved just to maintain adherence with the client, I believe. So, step number four. Step number four. So, when I presented on this to large groups, you, they kind of look at me like, I'm, like I've lost it. So, step number four is that I want you to fail. Okay, so this goes back to what we're talking about, about women grinding out reps and so on. Um, I find the biggest problem when I'm coaching women is that inability we talked about to kind of grind it out, get aggressive, get kind of down and dirty with the weights. It's not natural for women or it's not been, you know, it's been almost suppressed out, you know, suppressed into a place where they're not even they're not comfortable feeling it. Um, I can put a kind of a light deadlift in front of a woman or I can perhaps put a box in front of her or ask her to do push-ups and, and the instantaneous reaction is deer in headlights, I, I can't do that. They're looking like, what's this crazy bitch doing? And it's that point they say to me, I can't do this. Mm. And nine times out of 10, one of the right coaching and the right kind of pushing, should we say, and getting them in touch with that ability to kind of really get stuck in, they do do these things. So they do the deadlift, they do the push up, they start boxing. It's just getting over that mental barrier. Um, I, I'm very big on pushing women out of their comfort zone. So I often train groups of women together and I get those women to actually motivate each other. So we'll do, say, a drop set on the leg press. And those women are there cheering each other on and pushing to get kind of get grittier with the weight, so to speak. Uh, I also do a lot of kind of one rep max kind of events, so to speak, where we get guys involved. So they see how the guys train, you know, where they slap each other on the back or kind of call each other names. And they, I show them that, you know, adopt almost a frame of thinking like a man when you're training and you will achieve more when you're in your sessions. Mm. So I often think that, Perhaps for some of us, the biggest enemy in the gym is not kind of the weights or the lack of equipment or that you don't know the secret ab exercise. The biggest enemy is often ourselves. I did a session my first uh, five weeks when I learned to lift on, I think it was Monday last week, and I got one of the new PTs to train the girls with me. And he said it was so surprising because if you get, he was a new PT, he said if you get a group of guys together, and you try to teach them how to lift weights, they're getting stuck in, they're kind of throwing the weights around, they're patting each other on the back. He said to him, it was so shocking that the, the instantaneous reaction when I put the girls in front of the squat rack was, I can't do this. I, you know, they were holding back. And he just noticed that comparison between the sexes. So my, my goal really is to get them to push so hard that they do fail. And mm. um, in that, I often have to train with them as well. They see me kind of get ugly, they see me grunt, they see me kind of sweat. And I tell them, if you want to look pretty while you exercise, you're in the wrong area. <laughs> and by, by doing that, they kind of see the level they have to push themselves to. Brilliant. Well, you only learn from failure as well. Yeah, true. Exactly. Best moments are in failure. Mm. So, step number five. So step number five ties nicely into what I was just talking about. And it's about, you know, I say to them, you need to be an athlete. And they look at me like, well, what is she talking about? I'm, I'm not an athlete. I don't go to track, I I'm never going to be an athlete, I'm never going to be in the Olympics. But it's adopting that athletic mindset, it's essentially what I want them to do. I want them to have a non-aesthetic goal. So the first seminar for my Learn to Live course, I have a slide which just says focus on being stronger, nothing else. 
don't focus on fat loss, don't focus on anything else, just focus on just getting stronger and the good stuff will happen. Um, to a lot of them, it's a bit of an alien goal, you know, to have something that is based around strength, you know, it could be speed, it could be anything. Um, so yeah, I, I try and push them to think like an athlete, train like an athlete, recover like an athlete as well. So I, I, I do get a lot of women and they come to me and they, you know, as I said, they kind of hold parts of their body and they're like, I want to get rid of this. I want to kind of get, I want this to shrink or I want this to get smaller. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, you know, aesthetics matter. That's why most of the women come on my course. Mm. Uh, but when I get them to kind of sign up to a Tough Mudder or I get them to sign up for their first 5K or perhaps it might be as simple as doing their first push-up, when they have that goal, alongside an aesthetic goal, they are more committed and they're more likely to stay with what they're doing. Uh, I often say, you know, someone like Jessica Ennis Hill, she doesn't have that body, she doesn't have those abs, those amazing legs, because she gets up in the morning and she wants to get rid of this, or, you know, she wants to slim her belly down. She goes to track, to train, to be the best version of herself. Mm. You know, it's something I instill with my daughter as well, so when she's choosing her breakfast, I'll say, maybe you should choose, you know, maybe you should choose a porridge over the sugary cereal, because that's going to help you perform better at football or Mai Tai later on. So it's something that I'm, I'm really big on. Yeah, I've done that a lot with my cousins, actually. Uh, one of my cousins is really into football, and uh, he was speaking to me about kind of eating a bit better. He was kind of already sort of aware of it and conscious, and I started to relate everything to football because for him, that was his trigger. That's what he's into. So I'm like, well, if you drink milk after training, it will help you know, grow your muscles, you'll help recover quickly. Uh, before a game, you might want to do this, and we can focus on porridge. Now, make sure you, know, you eat fruit because you're a recovering athlete, and you know it all sunk in, and they're, they're all, he's doing it. He's doing it all because he relates it to something that he's emotionally tied to. He yeah. wants that outcome from. I had that my I took my daughter to one of her football matches recently. So she was playing on the school team, and in the car on the way there, she turned to me and she said, "Mum, I'm very I'm very worried about our goalkeeper." And I said, what, "What are you worried about?" What? And she said, well, "I watched him at lunch, and he only ate fish. He didn't have any carbohydrate." And at that point, half of me thought I've created a monster here, but half of me thought this girl gets it. She yeah. gets what I've, I'm trying to kind of instill in her and the women that I train. So it's about being an athlete thing. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so are we at six now? Six. Number six, yeah. So as much as I want women to be more, number six is to do less. Okay. In my job, I have a lot of women come to me and they are doing... Some of those, when I read through what they're doing on a weekly basis, it exhausts me. So you've got the women who are doing their seven, eight, nine classes, sometimes three in a row. Then they go for a swim, then they walk their dog ten kilometres three times a week. Uh, they like to go for a run, they're training for a half marathon. You know, they come to me and they're, they're doing all this stuff. And on the side as well, they've got their job, they've got their partner, they've got male kids. You know, they may have financial rights and they've got all this stuff going on. And you can see it, they're all just knackered. And... What I try and help them to do really is to kind of not limit the amount of exercise, but do what as much as they can in the sessions they have available to them, and reduce that amount of activity. So you know, you know, they find it more enjoyable to get more results. They stop hitting plateaus. Mm. I had um, a midwife come to me, fantastic, amazing, kind of feisty woman. So she'd come in after say a twelve-hour shift in the hospital, and she'd be training, doing one of my circuit classes. Eventually, I got onto my course, and, and she sat there and she talked to me. She said, "Look, I'm, I'm really struggling here because I'm doing all this exercise, but I'm not seeing any results." And as someone like myself who was formerly bigger, she was holding on to this strict exercise regime as a way of keeping her, or th thought it was the way to keep her weight down. So I looked at her and I said, "You know, how about this? How about just do what I say for a month? If it doesn't work, I will give you free personal training sessions. You know, if you gain weight or what have you." I said, why don't we just try lifting weights three times a week and a couple of cardio sessions? Because she walked around the hospital all night, she's quite busy as it was, and she looked like a deer in headlights. She just looked absolutely terrified at the prospect of dropping, you know, the, her classes and so on and so on. And she came back to me, she's tried it, she came back to me three weeks later and she said, you know what, Aldi, I've lost five pounds. And I thought, that's brilliant. But aside from that, she said that her husband and her children and her friends was so much happier because she was finally in an evening. She was finally there. She was, yeah, she was she present. She had a life. Yeah, yeah. She was, and I think that's the thing. I don't want 
girls that I train, I don't want exercise to dominate their life to the point that it's kind of suppressing any enjoyment, you know, and it's it's another stress to add to that long list of things to do. And what we need to speak about here is that a lot of people have also that obsessive attitude because they believe, like you've rightly said, if they don't do it, they'll put on weight. But the reality is the big change you really, one and only change you really need to make here is tweak your nutrition. Like, we still need to appreciate that the amount of food we eat is going to be pretty determinant of you know our body weight. So if you're training all the time and you train a bit less, then we just need to eat a bit less. Yeah. And the other side of this is, remember, if we train really hard, we might end up putting our body into a fatigued state. And if you're in a fatigued state, your body will try and conserve energy by not using much energy, which this means it will decrease the amount of NEAT you expend. So basically how much you move. So rather than walking up the elevator, uh, sorry, the stairs, because you're feeling energized, you'll go up the elevator because you're feeling tired and you might be feeling tired as a result of all the training you're doing. So if your training is causing you to move less, that's going to have a bigger impact on your daily calorie expenditure. Definitely. So I say, I say to some people and that I get in and see me, I say, why don't you take one of those classes, one of those hours, go shopping, start researching, and start you know, preparing some lunches for work. So take those hours instead of being in the gym or in your classes or running or whatever, you, and go in the kitchen and start making food. It's going to be a lot better time and you're going to achieve your goals a lot more quickly mm. by doing that. Nice. Step number seven. Step number seven is, you know, I don't need to preach to anyone on this podcast, but it's to lift weights. And obviously the way I do that is by coaching my women through my course. But what I want to say about my Learn to Lift course is it's, it's so much more than just lifting weights. It's for the first time I'm bringing women into something where they're using training and they're using kind of the gym, should we say, to become more. So it's not about kind of diminishing size. It's not about slimming down. It's not about burning off the cake you had last night. It's about using your body and realizing kind of the power that you have. The girls who come to me and they, you know, they text me what have you, and they're like, I just, I just did something, and you know, I just did something at the gym I've never done before. I just did something in the gym I never thought I could do, and they're suddenly seeing that it can be enjoyable. They're suddenly starting to celebrate what their bodies can do and moving away from how they look. And I think that switch in mentality is so healthy. You know. Um, I get so many of the women, they, they do come to my course thinking fat loss. I ask everyone in the room, like, what are you here for? Is there any rugby players? Is there any kind of athletes? The majority of them are there for fat loss. And they go in, you know, wanting to burn fat, wanting to kind of lose weight. But they come out actually wanting to be stronger. And it, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't have to be lifting weights. It could be learn to scuba dive. It could be learn to rock climb. As long as that thing is changing the way you approach exercise and viewing exercise as a means, and food as well, viewing food, food and exercise as a means of becoming more, that's what it's about. Mm. So that's what I'm looking really to do, just change the mindset. Nice. Yeah. Love it. And I think, sorry. I'm done. That's it. Love it. Yeah, carry on. So Also, what um, something I do notice in my gym is there's a lot of women who kind of will wear crop tops, yeah? But something that you ask the majority of the gym going public, the women there, they will not be comfortable doing that. And okay, it shows fantastic things about body composition but it also shows that these women are confident mm. they feel fantastic they you know they might look better some have abs some don't but the general feeling there is that they're kind of they're happy with the way they look and it's that physical empowerment that gives them that confidence and that's what i'm looking for really that's what i'm looking to build mm. within these women i i agree that's why i wear a crop top in the gym fantastic <laughs> come visit your gym <laughs> Members only, private. Of course. <laughs> so, step number seven? Eight? No, eight, eight. Yeah. Right, um, number eight, I haven't really talked that much about nutrition. Um, it's just in one step, really, because I don't believe it should be that complicated. It's so many people come to me and like, what should I do with my macros? Should I cut my calories? Should I wear a Fitbit? Should I do HIIT training? And I I think it should, it should be simple because there's so much crap out there, it just needs to be boiled down to, you know, the, the basics really. Um, so I as a person, I love food, okay, I, I love cooking for friends, I love going to restaurants, I'm from, a, I'm from a Filipino background as well, so food is love, you don't go to my mum's house without having seconds, thirds. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I was always the kid at the party who was sat at the table still eating party rings while all the other kids were off playing. So I absolutely love food. Um, and I did, you know, when I was bigger, I would eat what wasn't the best for me, shall we say. Uh, so people are probably thinking, like, how, how did that change? So how did you go from that place where you were kind of bigger and you didn't eat kind of food caution to the wind and then ended up where you are now? You eat and you coach other people for success. So the one thing that changed me was my relationship with food. When I started training and uh, looking more into what I was doing, I started to look at a plate and actually look at what it did for me. So my relationship with food became more positive. It was about nourishment. Mm -hmm. And I often say to people I train, when you're looking for a prospective partner, you're looking at that person or your current partner, you're looking at them saying, does this person make me feel fulfilled? Am I energized around them? Do they build me up? Do, do I feel great when I'm with them? Do, you know, are they going to compliment what I do? Are they going to build me up in life? And I say to the girls, I'm like, that should be the way you look at the food you put in your body. If you're investing these calories in, what are you getting out as a result? If you're looking on your plate and everything's beige, it's pretty much not going to do much for you in terms of training, in terms of body composition. If you look at your plate and you've got kind of some good healthy fats on there, you've got a steak, you know, you've got eggs that are, you may have avocado, you may have the majority of beautiful things in that plate that are going to do you good. And I think that's one thing I try and push home about kind of just viewing food as what is this doing for you? Forget the calories, forget everything else. Start kind of viewing food as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I try and advise when it comes to food is, you know, is focusing on energy. How does food make you feel? So I don't know about you, but the amount of times I hear in a day, and I work in the fitness industry, the amount of times I hear people tell me they are tired. You know, oh, I don't know what's wrong had a great night's sleep, or I'm just so tired. And then if you drill down, there's no vegetables, there's no balance, most of the food is kind of beige or processed. Um, and it's that that I try and I try and tell people, try and move towards eating for wellness. That's key. And, um, you know, try and move away from having those 4 p.m. energy slumps when you want to fall asleep at your desk and crawl under the table and go see. No one likes that, so why not? approach your food with the idea that this is going to make me feel fantastic it's going to make me more productive mm -hmm. love it i agree you are kind of a female, yeah. female version of me aldi <laughs> it's great to hear <laughs> in terms of your perspective and how you view really what's important yeah great to hear step number nine step number nine okay um Step number nine is not so much a step, but it's a bit of advice, something I want to rectify with the world, and it's to stop perpetuating the problem. You know, this is really key to, to my message, I think. I hear it all the time, and I'd say on an almost daily basis, I hear beautiful, fantastic, conditioned women putting themselves down, and it drives me insane. I, you know, the words they use to describe themselves, horrific, I'm hideous, it's... I'm, I'm so fat, I'm disgusting, it's, it's really damaging, it's really toxic, and I'm really trying to stamp on it, it's something you'll never hear me do in front of my children, in front of my clients, you know, everyone has body issues, I have them, you know, you know there's things I don't like about my body, but I won't focus on them, it's not a big deal. Uh, I had a, a woman in um, my gym who was a beautiful woman, you know, she had three kids, size set, you know, beautiful figure, trained well, ate well. And eventually she brought her 12 year old daughter into the gym. And I thought, great, it's everything I'm about, you know, getting female empowerment, better role model and see your mother training. And she stood there talking to me. She grabbed her non existent stomach and she started telling me how she was hideous, she had to get rid of it, how she couldn't wear the clothes she wanted to get. And all the while her daughter was looking wide eyed up at her. And I thought, this is just so, oh, bad. Is so wrong. Um, um, I'm not immune to it either. I, I went to a, you know, regularly have sleepovers with my kids, you know, the family kind of thing, take popcorn, go to a hotel, went to a swimming pool and I walked into the swimming pool and I was kind of sat next to a group of 20 year old women who never had kids, no stretch marks, beautiful bodies and I sat there next to them and I would not walk past them to go to the swimming pool to play with my children because I felt so self-conscious about the way I looked. Now this is rare for me, it's, it's kind of a, a, a moment of weakness I have. And um, my partner came over at the time and he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? And I explained, I was having, you know, the typical female sulk where you're not talking, you're kind of sat, kind of mulling things over. And that evening I did not get in the pool with my children because I was so conscious of how I looked. 
And it was those little, I'd give them power to those voices in my head. Mm. And my partner's actually, I was in women's health at the time, he's like, what are you doing? You're in a national magazine. You're, women look up to you. You're, you're meant to be this, you know, wonder woman. And you're sat here on the side of the pool. So I think these things we do and the way we talk to ourselves is, is, is awful, really. And I say to the women that I coach, you know, if you, if you stand there talking about yourself in this way and you've got someone look at you who looks up to you, I mean, we all think our friends are beautiful, and you're saying how hideous you are, you can guarantee that girl's going to turn around and start looking at herself and say, what if she thinks that about herself? I must have a hell of a lot wrong with me. Mm. So it's something that I really, you know, I really want to kind of move away from. I'm, my daughter came home from school about, this was about two years ago, and she plays a lot of sports. She's that typical, very lean kind of eight-year-old, and the kids in her class have told her she had matchstick legs. And I thought, well, you know, these things happen at school. Kids can be mean. But at that moment when she told me, I turned to her and I said, look, we're not going to focus on how your legs look, because that's neither here nor there. We're going to focus on, you know, the races you've won. We're going to focus on those kung fu kicks that have won you kind of belts and medals. We're going to focus on those amazing goals you've scored not how they look. And that's kind of what I want to drill home. We need to stop talking about ourselves in this way. So I'll, I suppose I'll put the quandary that you had in the pool with the, the women, I'll put it back to you. If you had that situation again now, what would you do differently or what thought process would you have that was different to help you manage that situation in the way that potentially you should have done? I think I don't really see myself at that point in time how other people saw me. You know, I saw, I, I let all those kind of demons come in and tell me, you know, you've got this, you've got this with your body, you've got that with your body. And I, I almost, I thought too much. And that was almost dangerous. You know, sometimes being alone with your own thoughts is not the best thing. Mm. If I just got up off that sun lounger and I jumped in the pool and got on with it, I think you know, I would have had a lot, you know, I would have had a lot better evening and I would have felt better as well about it. Mm -hmm. The fact I sat there and I allowed my negative voices to be more loud than the positive ones was really where it went wrong that evening. I woke up the next day, I was fine, admittedly, but I had, you know, something I learned about myself that day. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, so if someone is in that situation, like, because for me, there, there's a time reactive issue there. You could have sat on the sun lounger, you could have started to feel more negative, and you, after 10 seconds, said, no, this isn't good, and you jumped in the pool. What if someone was sat there for another minute, two minutes, three minutes, and started chewing over that situation? What advice would you give to someone to reframe that thought process when they've already started to become very accustomed and friendly to their negative thought process? And going, I think focusing on positives, what is it that, you know, and this is very hard for a lot of women, what is it you like about your body? What is it that you, you know, that you look at and you actually do like? Someone that, you know, they can look in the mirror and they can say they don't like anything they see, which is really, I think the statistic is 98% of women are, you know, unhappy with something they see in the mirror. So it's really hard. Um, when I spoke at BFIT recently, my first thing to do with the women in that room was give them a little card and it was to write about something they liked about their body. And it was something, you know, it could be anything. It could be something they do, it could be something the way they feel, it could be something, you know, it could be the way their arms look, when they've been training. Um, and I got them to do that. And then I kind of delivered this talk about these 10 steps and I asked them again to kind of write down what they, you know, write down another thing about they like about their body. And I got these lists back and they were they were a lot longer. So it's I've, I've kind of want people to focus on the positives mm -hmm. and not dwell on the negatives. I think that's also a habit thing as well. I think you've got to practice focusing on the ha uh, the positives because it's, like anything, it's not something that you can just turn on. Um, it's like, it's kind of like, I talk to people who are quite a bit about meditation and I find that I can put my brain into a meditative state very quickly because I've practiced how to do it. Like these days when I go to bed, I fall asleep within like two minutes most of the time. Like I'm able to calm my brain down so quickly. But that didn't just happen. I had to practice how to be able to do that and put my brain into a very positive state. And the time it took me to do that just reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced. And I think for you, what you're saying is women need to practice appreciating. They need to practice, like even if they like their eyes, 
okay, keep saying to yourself that you love your eyes and that they're beautiful, and then actually you start to realise that you like your ears, and now it's your eyes and your ears, and actually now it's your eyes, ears, and your shoulders, because actually you, you do appreciate that. And now there's so much more to focus on that's positive because you start to realise there is more about you than you like than, than before. I think going back to what you said about meditation as well, it's that ability to, um, when you meditate, you silence everything, you silence the noise. And I think in that moment, being able to meditate to the extent that you're pushing out the negative, you're not allowing that to enter your consciousness, is quite powerful. So it's training your mind to kind of not focus and dwell on that in that dark place. Mm. I think in those situations as well, you've also got to appreciate that you can't give people your energy when you don't even know them. Like, like I only know you, I don't know you that well, I think. So if I saw you and at, at some point in time I thought, ah, oh, she's judging me, my key emotion in that moment is I actually don't care what you think. I don't know you enough to give you that much of my emotional energy to care what you think about my body, who I am, my actions, everything, because it, it just doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Now, the closer that person becomes to me, the more I care about what they think. If they're a partner, a family friend, or someone that is close, then I respect that opinion. So me saying that does not mean that I don't care about your opinion or respect you as a person, but the key underlying emotion is I, in the grand scheme of things, can't care what you think because I am who I am as a person. And if that person can't appreciate me or see me for the person that I am, then that is really not someone that I want to be around. And I think that's something that I like people to focus on. If someone judges someone in that way, do you really want to be friendly with them? Is that a person that you'd get on with? Is that a person you'd want to know? I don't want to know people that are that judgmental about other people. Stark <laughs> reality is they can fuck off. <laughs> But that is the reality, and we give so yeah. much energy to that situation. And I'm like, why? I think it was a lot easier to get older as well, to have yeah. a kind of fuck it attitude. You practice um, it, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I get a lot of people who are kind of people pleasers, and they want to be liked by everyone, and they want to do everything for everyone. You know, going back to that thing about spreading yourself too thin. I think, you know, as you get older, you develop this ability to just go, screw it. I don't care as much. It doesn't matter. I'm going to get on with my life. There's bigger things going on. Mm. So, step number nine? Ten now, almost oh, there. I could never count. <laughs> it's a running it's theme nice. in the show, don't worry about it. Considering I'm half oriental, I should be good at maths. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last one is really pulling it all together. It's focusing on the mindset over behaviour. Uh, it's my belief that kind of the diet industry, all these quick fixes and fads, they're built on changing behaviours without ever question the why, why, you know, why am I doing this, why am I following this certain diet plan, why am I strapping my waist into a corset and going to train, um, why am I eating a liquid only diet, you know, we do these things in parrot fashion, with, you know, without understanding the why, and that's really what I want people to focus on, the mindset, the mindset of kind of becoming better, mm. you know, and applying all the things I've said in the previous steps, and, you know, making that difference, making that change, educating yourself and changing the way you think about kind of exercise and nutrition. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, they have been some pretty amazing 10 steps. Um, I think, I hope it's given people a lot of perspective. Um, they are all topics that in a way we've talked about on the show, but we've hopefully come at them from different angles. We've also, and I love the way that you included a lot of real life experiences in it, clients that you've coached, situations that you've had, problems that you've had yourself as well, because you will fully admit that you are not a perfect person, just like I am not a perfect person. We don't know everything. We don't know all the answers to every situation. We might be coaches, but we're still working through plenty of stuff ourselves. Like, you know, this is a journey for us, just like it is a journey for you. So. To hear the way that you positioned those points was really refreshing, um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, as a result of today, it would be really nice for people to be able to find out a bit more about you, where they can follow you on social media, that kind of stuff. So let me give you the mic and tell people where to come and find a bit more of your information. 
Okay, on Facebook, you'll search Aldine Preisner, that's A L D I N E, and Preisner, P R E I S N E R, so that you can connect with me there. On um, my Learn to Lift group, is, so it's Learn to Lift, it's a closed group, so it's mainly women, but men are welcome to. <laughs> so if you want to search that, uh, Instagram, I'm Aldine underscore Preisner underscore PT. Uh, on Twitter, I mean, I'm getting all the bases covered here, aren't I? Um, at Aldine PT. And finally, my website is www.aldinepriceland.com. So loads of different channels there. Nice one. The crux of it is, if someone types your name into something, they'll hopefully find you. Yeah, there can't be too many of me around. So. <laughs> nice. Um, I will also put the links in the show description on iTunes for this if people are unsure. Uh, but check the name as the title of the show and type it into something. Um, all that leaves me to say is, Aldine, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for sharing uh, your pearls of wisdom. <laughs> thank you for having me on. I wish you all the best in keep doing what you're doing. It sounds absolutely fantastic. People, get involved. It would be really cool if you reached out, out to Aldine. She's on social media. She's like me. She's happy to talk to you, happy to give advice. Uh, she is there to help people on their journey. That's why we're in these positions. So say something on social media. It's cool to be able to engage. Um, otherwise, I'll be back with another show next week. Don't ask me who. Um, just ask me when. It will be next Thursday, as always. Uh, all that leaves me to say, again, is Aldine, thank you. Thank you. And for everyone listening on the show, keep being more awesome, and I will see you next week. Goodbye. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 263.